Section 21 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2012. Letter 17. Ichinono, July 12. Two foreign ladies, two fair haired foreign infants, a long haired foreign dog, and a foreign gentleman, who, without these accompaniments, might have escaped notice, attracted a large but kindly crowd to the canal side when I left Niigata. The natives bore away the children on their shoulders, the Fisons walked to the extremity of the canal to bid me good-bye, the sampan shot out upon the broad swirling flood of the Shinano, and an awful sense of loneliness fell upon me. We crossed the Shinano, pulled up the narrow, embanked Shinkawa, had a desperate struggle with the flooded Aganokawa, were much impeded by strings of nauseous manure boats on the narrow, discoloured Kajikawa, wondered at the interminable melon and cucumber fields, and at the odd river life, and, after hard poling for six hours, reached Kisaki, having accomplished exactly ten miles. Then three kurumas with trotting runners took us twenty miles at the low rate of four and a half sen per ri. In one place a board closed the road, but on representing to the chief man of the village that the traveller was a foreigner, he courteously allowed me to pass, the express agent having accompanied me thus far to see that I got through all right. The road was tolerably populous throughout the day's journey, and the farming villages, which extended much of the way, Tsuiji, Kazayanage, Mono, and Mari, were neat, and many of the farms had bamboo fences to screen them from the road. It was, on the whole, a pleasant country, and the people, though little clothed, did not look either poor or very dirty. The soil was very light and sandy. There were, in fact, pine barrens, sandy ridges with nothing on them but spindly scotch firs and fir scrub, but the sandy levels between them, being heavily manured and cultivated like gardens, bore splendid crops of cucumbers trained like peas, melons, vegetable marrow, arum esculentum, sweet potatoes, maize, tea, tiger lilies, beans and onions, and extensive orchards with apples and pears trained literally on trellis work eight feet high were a novelty in the landscape though we were all day drawing nearer to mountains wooded to their summits on the east the amount of vegetation was not burdensome the rice swamps were few and the air felt drier and less relaxing as my runners were trotting merrily over one of the pine barrens, I met Dr. Palm returning from one of his medical religious expeditions with a tandem of two naked coolies who were going over the ground at a great pace, and I wished that some of the most staid directors of the Edinburgh Medical Missionary Society could have the shock of seeing him. I shall not see a European again for some weeks." from Tsuiji, a very neat village where we changed kurumas, we were jolted along over a shingly road to Nakajo, a considerable town just within treaty limits. The Japanese doctors there, as in other places, are Dr. Palm's cordial helpers, and five or six of them, whom he regards as possessing the rare virtues of candor, earnestness, and single-mindedness, and who have studied English medical works, have clubbed together to establish the dispensary, and, under Dr. Palm's instructions, are even carrying out the antiseptic treatment successfully, after some ludicrous failures. We dashed through Nakajo, as kuruma runners always dash through towns and villages, got out of it in a drizzle upon an avenue of firs, three or four deep, which extends from Nakajo to Kurokawa, and for some miles beyond were jolted over a damp valley on which tea and rice alternated, crossed two branches of the Shingli Kurokawa on precarious bridges, rattled into the town of Kurokawa, much decorated with flags and lanterns, where the people were all congregated at a shrine where there was much drumming, and a few girls, much painted and bedizened, were dancing or posturing on a raised and covered platform, in honour of the god of the place, 
whose matsuri or festival it was and out again to be mercilessly jolted under the furs in the twilight to a solitary house where the owner made some difficulty about receiving us as his license did not begin till the next day but eventually succumbed and gave me his one upstairs room exactly five feet high which hardly allowed of my standing upright with my hat on he then rendered it suffocating by closing the amado for the reason often given that if he left them open and the house was robbed the police would not only blame him severely but would not take any trouble to recover his property he had no rice so i indulged in a feast of delicious cucumbers i never saw so many eaten as in that district children gnaw them all day long and even babies on their mothers backs suck them with avidity just now they are sold for a sen a dozen it is a mistake to arrive at a yadoya after dark even if the best rooms are not full it takes fully an hour to get my food and the room ready and meanwhile i cannot employ my time usefully because of the mosquitoes there was heavy rain all night accompanied by the first wind that i have heard since landing and the fitful creaking of the pines and the drumming from the shrine made me glad to get up at sunrise or rather at daylight for there has not been a sunrise since i came or a sunset either that day we travelled by Sekki to Kawaguchi in Kurumas, that is, we were sometimes bumped over stones, sometimes deposited on the edge of a quagmire and asked to get out, and sometimes compelled to walk for two or three miles at a time along the infamous bridle track above the river Arai, up which two men could hardly push and haul an empty vehicle, and, as they often had to lift them bodily and carry them for some distance, I was really glad when we reached the village of Kawaguchi to find that they could not go farther, though, as we could only get one horse, I had to walk the last stage in a torrent of rain, poorly protected by my paper waterproof cloak. We are now in the midst of the great central chain of the Japanese mountains, which extends almost without a break for nine hundred miles, and is from forty to one hundred miles in width broken up into interminable ranges traversable only by steep passes from one thousand to five thousand feet in height with innumerable rivers ravines and valleys the heights and ravines heavily timbered the rivers impetuous and liable to freshets and the valleys invariably terraced for ice it is in the valleys that the villages are found, and regions more isolated I have never seen, shut out by bad roads from the rest of Japan. The houses are very poor, the summer costume of the men consists of the maro only, and that of the women of trousers with an open shirt, and when we reached Kurosawa last night it had dwindled to trousers only. There is little traffic and very few horses are kept, one, two, or three constituting the livestock of a large village. The shops, such as they are, contain the barest necessaries of life. Millet and buckwheat, rather than rice, with the universal daikon, are the staples of diet. The climate is wet in summer and bitterly cold in winter. Even now it is comfortless enough for the people to come in wet, just to warm the tips of their fingers at the irori, stifled the while with the stinging smoke, while the damp wind flaps the torn paper of the windows about, and damp draughts sweep the ashes over the tatami until the house is hermetically sealed at night. These people never know anything of what we regard as comfort, and in the long winter, when the wretched bridal tracks are blocked by snow and the freezing wind blows strong and the families huddle round the smoking fire by their doleful glimmer of the andon, without work, books or play, to shiver through the long evenings in chilly dreariness and herd together for warmth at night like animals, their condition must be as miserable as anything short of grinding poverty can make it. I saw things at their worst that night, as I tramped into the hamlet of Numa, down whose sloping street a swollen stream was running, which the people were banking out of their houses. I was wet and tired, and the woman at the one wretched yadoya met me, saying, 
I am sorry it's very dirty and quite unfit for so honourable a guest. And she was right, for the one room was up a ladder, the windows were in tatters, there was no charcoal for a hibachi, no eggs, and the rice was so dirty and so full of a small black seed as to be unfit to eat. Worse than all, there was no transport office, the hamlet did not possess a horse, and it was only by sending to a farmer five miles off, and by much bargaining, that I got on the next morning. In estimating the number of people in a given number of houses in Japan, it is usual to multiply the houses by five, but I had the curiosity to walk through Numa and get Ito to translate the tallies which hang outside all Japanese houses, with the names, number, and sexes of their inmates, and in twenty-four houses there were three hundred and seven people. In some there were four families, the grandparents, the parents, the eldest son with his wife and family, and a daughter or two with their husbands and children. The eldest son, who inherits the house and land, almost invariably brings his wife to his father's house, where she often becomes little better than a slave to her mother-in-law. By rigid custom she literally forsakes her own kindred, and her filial duty is transferred to her husband's mother, who often takes a dislike to her, and instigates her son to divorce her if she has no children. My hostess had induced her son to divorce his wife, and she could give no better reason for it than that she was lazy. The Numa people, she said, had never seen a foreigner, so, though the rain still fell heavily, they were astir in the early morning. They wanted to hear me speak, so I gave my orders to Ito in public. Yesterday was a most toilsome day, mainly spent in stumbling up and sliding down the great passes of Futai, Takanasu, and Yenoiki, all among forest-covered mountains, deeply cleft by forest-choked ravines, with now and then one of the snowy peaks of Aizu breaking the monotony of the ocean of green. The horse's shoes were tied and untied every few minutes, and we made just a mile an hour. At last we were deposited in a most unpromising place in the hamlet of Tabagawa, and were told that a rice merchant, after waiting for three days, had got every horse in the country. At the end of two hours' chaffering, one baggage coolie was produced, some of the things were put on the rice horses, and a steed with a pack saddle was produced for me, in the shape of a plunk and pretty little cow, which carried me safely over the magnificent pass of Ori, and down to the town of Okimi among rice fields, where, in a drowning rain, I was glad to get shelter with a number of coolies by a wood fire, till another pack cow was produced, and we walked on through the rice fields and up into the hills again to Kurosawa, where I had intended to remain. But there was no inn, and the farmhouse where they take in travellers, besides being on the edge of a malarious pond and being dark and full of stinging smoke, was so awfully dirty and full of living creatures that, exhausted as I was, I was obliged to go on. But it was growing dark, there was no transport office, and for the first time the people were very slightly extortionate, and drove Ito nearly to his wit's end. The peasants do not like to be out after dark, for they are afraid of ghosts and all sorts of devilments, and it was difficult to induce them to start so late in the evening. There was not a house clean enough to rest in, so I sat on a stone and thought about the people for over an hour. Children with scald head, scabies and sore eyes swarmed. Every woman carried a baby on her back, and every child who could stagger under one carried one too. Not one woman wore anything but cotton trousers. One woman reeled about drunk and disorderly. Ito sat on a stone hiding his face in his hands, and when I asked him if he were ill, he replied in a most lamentable voice, I don't know what I'm to do. I'm so ashamed for you to see such things. The boy is only eighteen, and I pitied him. I asked him if women were often drunk, and he said they were in Yokohama, but they usually kept in their houses. 
He says that when their husbands give them money to pay bills at the end of a month, they often spend it in sake, and that they sometimes get sake in shops and have it put down as rice or tea. The old, old story. I looked at the dirt and barbarism and asked if this were the Japan of which I had read. Yet a woman in this unseemly costume firmly refused to take the two or three sen which it is usual to leave at a place where you rest, because she said that I had had water and not tea, and after I had forced it on her she returned it to Ito, and this redeeming incident sent me away much comforted. From Numa the distance here is only one and a half ri, but it is over the steep pass of Honoki, which is ascended and descended by hundreds of crude stone steps, not pleasant in the dark. On this pass I saw birches for the first time. At its foot we entered Yamagata-ken by a good bridge, and shortly reached this village, in which an unpromising-looking farmhouse is the only accommodation. But though all the rooms but two are taken up with silkworms, those two are very good, and look upon a miniature lake and rockery. The one objection to my room is that to get either in or out of it, I must pass through the other, which is occupied by five tobacco merchants, who are waiting for transport, and who while away the time by strumming on that instrument of dismay, the samisen. No horses or cows can be got for me, so I am spending the day quietly here, rather glad to rest, for I am much exhausted. When I am suffering much from my spine, Ito always gets into a fright and thinks I am going to die, as he tells me when I am better, but shows his anxiety by a short, surely manner, which is most disagreeable. He thinks we shall never get through the interior. Mr. Brunton's excellent map fails in this region, so it is only by fixing on the well-known city of Yamagata and devising routes to it that we get on. Half the evening is spent in consulting Japanese maps, if we can get them, and in questioning the housemaster and transport agent, and any chance travellers, but the people know nothing beyond the distance of a few ri, and the agents seldom tell one anything beyond the next stage. When I inquire about the unbeaten tracks that I wish to take, the answers are, it's an awful road through mountains, or there are many bad rivers to cross, or there are none but farmers' houses to stop at. No encouragement is ever given, but we get on, and shall get on, I doubt not, though the hardships are not what I would desire in my present state of health. Very few horses are kept here. Cows and coolies carry much of the merchandise, and women as well as men carry heavy loads. A baggage coolie carries about fifty pounds, but here merchants carrying their own goods from Yamagata actually carry from 90 to 140 pounds, and even more. It is sickening to meet these poor fellows struggling over the mountain passes in evident distress. Last night five of them were resting on the summit ridge of a pass, gasping violently. Their eyes were starting out, all their muscles, rendered painfully visible by their leanness, were quivering, Rills of blood from the bite of insects, which they cannot drive away, were literally running all over their naked bodies, washed away here and there by copious perspiration. Truly, in the sweat of their brows, they were eating bread and earning an honest living for their families. Suffering and hard-worked as they were, they were quite independent. I have not seen a beggar or beggary in this strange country. The women were carrying seventy pounds. These burden-bearers have their backs covered by a thick pad of plaited straw. On this rests a ladder, curved up at the lower end like the runners of a sleigh. On this the load is carefully packed till it extends from below the man's waist to a considerable height above his head. It is covered with waterproof paper, securely roped and thatched with straw, and is supported by a broad padded band just below the collar bones. Of course, as the man walks nearly bent double, and the position is a very painful one, he requires to stop and straighten himself frequently, 
and unless he meets with a bank of convenient height he rests the bottom of his burden on a short stout pole with an l-shaped top carried for this purpose the carrying of enormous loads is quite a feature of this region and so i am sorry to say our red stinging ants and the small gadflies which molest the coolies yesterday's journey was eighteen miles in twelve hours Ichinono is a nice industrious hamlet, given up, like all others, to rearing silkworms, and the pure white and sulphur-yellow cocoons are drying on mats in the sun everywhere. I. L. B. End of section 21《We left Ichinono early on a fine morning with three pack cows, one of which I rode, and their calves, very comely kind, with small noses, short horns, straight spines, and deep bodies. I thought that I might get some fresh milk, but the idea of anything but a calf milking a cow was so new to the people that there was a universal laugh, and Ito told me that they thought it most disgusting, and that the Japanese think it most disgusting in foreigners to put anything with such a strong smell and taste into their tea. All the cows had cotton cloths printed with blue dragons, suspended under their bodies to keep them from mud and insects, and they wear straw shoes and cords through the cartilages of their noses. The day being fine, a great deal of rice and sake was on the move, and we met hundreds of pack cows, all of the same comely breed, in strings of four. We crossed the Sakura Toge, from which the view is beautiful, got horses at the mountain village of Shirakasawa, crossed more passes, and in the afternoon reached the village of Tenoko. There, as usual, I sat under the veranda of the transport office and waited for the one horse which was available. It was a large shop, but contained not a single article of European make. In the one room a group of women and children sat round the fire, and the agent sat as usual with a number of ledgers at a table a foot high, on which his grandchild was lying on a cushion. Here Ito dined on seven dishes of horrors, and they brought me sake, tea, rice, and black beans. The last are very good. We had some talk about the country, and the man asked me to write his name in English characters, and to write my own in a book. Meanwhile a crowd assembled, and the front row sat on the ground that the others might see over their heads. They were dirty and pressed very close, and when the women of the house saw that I felt the heat, they gracefully produced fans and fanned me for a whole hour. On asking the charge, they refused to make any and would not receive anything. They had not seen a foreigner before, they said. They would despise themselves for taking anything. They had my honourable name in their book. Not only that, but they put up a parcel of sweetmeats, and the man wrote his name on a fan and insisted on my accepting it. I was grieved to have nothing to give them but some English pins, but they had never seen such before, and soon circulated them among the crowd. I told them truly that I should remember them as long as I remember Japan, and went on, much touched by their kindness. The lofty pass of Utsu, which is ascended and descended by a number of stone slabs, is the last of the passes of these choked-up ranges. From its summit, in the welcome sunlight, I joyfully looked down upon the noble plain of Yonezawa, about thirty miles long and from ten to eighteen broad, one of the gardens of Japan, wooded and watered, covered with prosperous towns and villages, 
surrounded by magnificent mountains not altogether timbered and bounded at its southern extremity by ranges white with snow even in the middle of july in the long street of the farming village of matsuhara a man amazed me by running in front of me and speaking to me and on ito coming up he assailed him vociferously, and it turned out that he took me for an Aino, one of the subjugated aborigines of Yezo. I have before now been taken for a Chinese. Throughout the province of Echigo I have occasionally seen a piece of cotton cloth suspended by its four corners from four bamboo poles just above a quiet stream. Behind it there is usually a long narrow tablet, notched at the top, similar to those seen in cemeteries, with characters upon it. Sometimes bouquets of flowers are placed in the hollow top of each bamboo, and usually there are characters on the cloth itself. Within it always lies a wooden dipper. In coming down from Tenoko, I passed one of these close to the road, and a Buddhist priest was at that time pouring a dipper full of water into it, which strained slowly through. As he was going our way we joined him, and he explained its meaning. According to him, the tablet bears on it the kaimyo, or posthumous name of a woman. The flowers have the same significance as those which loving hands place on the graves of kindred. If there are characters on the cloth, they represent the well-known invocation of the Nichiren sect, Namo Miu Horenge Kyo. The pouring of the water into the cloth, often accompanied by telling the beads on a rosary, is a prayer. The whole is called the flowing invocation. I have seldom seen anything more plaintively affecting, for it denotes that a mother in the first joy of maternity has passed away to suffer, according to popular belief, in the lake of blood, one of the Buddhist hells, for a sin committed in a former state of being, and it appeals to every passer-by to shorten the penalties of a woman in anguish, for in that lake she must remain until the cloth is so utterly worn out that the water falls through it at once. Where the mountains come down upon the plain of Yonesawa, there are several raised banks, and you can take one step from the hillside to a dead level. The soil is dry and gravelly at the junction, ridges of pines appeared, and the look of the houses suggested increased cleanliness and comfort. A walk of six miles took us from Tenoko to Komatsu, a beautifully situated town of three thousand people, with a large trade in cotton goods, silk and sake. As I entered Komatsu, the first man whom I met turned back hastily, called into the first house the words which mean, Quick, here's a foreigner! The three carpenters who were at work there flung down their tools and, without waiting to put on their kimonos, sped down the street calling out the news, so that by the time I reached the yadoya a large crowd was pressing upon me. The front was mean and unpromising looking, but on reaching the back, by a stone bridge over a stream which ran through the house, I found a room, forty feet long by fifteen high, entirely open along one side to a garden, with a large fish-pond with goldfish, a pagoda, dwarf trees, and all the usual miniature adornments. Fusuma of wrinkled blue paper splashed with gold turned this gallery into two rooms, but there was no privacy, for the crowds climbed upon the roofs at the back and sat there patiently until night. These were daimyo's rooms. The posts and ceilings were ebony and gold, the mats very fine, the polished alcoves decorated with inlaid writing-tables and sword-racks, spears nine feet long with handles of lacquer inlaid with Venus's ear hung in the veranda. The washing-bowl was fine inlaid black lacquer, and the rice-bowls and their covers were gold lacquer. In this, as in many other yadoyas, there were kakemonos with large Chinese characters representing the names of the prime minister, provincial governor, or distinguished general who had honoured it by halting there, and lines of poetry were hung up, as is usual, in the same fashion. 
i have several times been asked to write something to be thus displayed i spent sunday at komatsu but not restfully owing to the nocturnal croaking of the frogs in the pond in it as in most towns there were shops which sell nothing but white frothy-looking cakes which are used for the goldfish which are so much prized and three times daily the women and children of the household came into the garden to feed them when i left komatsu there were fully sixty people inside the house and fifteen hundred outside walls verandas and even roofs being packed from nikko to komatsu mares had been exclusively used but there i encountered for the first time the terrible japanese pack-horse two horridly fierce-looking creatures were at the door with their heads tied down till their necks were completely arched when i mounted the crowd followed gathering as it went frightening the horse with the clatter of clogs and the sound of a multitude till he broke his head-rope and the frightened mago letting him go he proceeded down the street mainly on his hind feet squealing and striking savagely with his forefeet the crowd scattering to the right and left till as it surged past the police station four policemen came out and arrested it only to gather again however for there was a longer street down which my horse proceeded in the same fashion and looking round i saw ito's horse on his hind legs and ito on the ground my beast jumped over all ditches attacked all foot passengers with his teeth and behaved so like a wild animal that not all my previous acquaintance with the idiosyncrasies of horses enabled me to cope with him on reaching akaiyu we found a horse fair and as all the horses had their heads tightly tied down to posts they could only squeal and lash out with their hind feet which so provoked our animals that the baggage horse by a series of jerks and rearings divested himself of ito and most of the baggage and as i dismounted from mine he stood upright and my foot catching i fell on the ground when he made several vicious dashes at me with his teeth and forefeet which were happily frustrated by the dexterity of some mago these beasts forcibly remind me of the words whose mouth must be held with bit and bridle lest they turn and fall upon thee it was a lovely summer day though very hot and the snowy peaks of aizu scarcely looked cool as they glittered in the sunlight the plain of yonesawa with the prosperous town of yonesawa in the south and the frequented watering-place of akayu in the north is a perfect garden of eden tilled with a pencil instead of a plough growing in rich profusion rice cotton maize tobacco hemp indigo beans eggplants walnuts melons cucumbers persimmons apricots pomegranates a smiling and plenteous land an asiatic arcadia prosperous and independent all its bounteous acres belonging to those who cultivate them who live under their vines figs and pomegranates free from oppression a remarkable spectacle under an asiatic despotism yet still daikoku is the chief deity and material good is the one object of desire it is an enchanting region of beauty industry and comfort mountain girdled and watered by the bright matsuka everywhere there are prosperous and beautiful farming villages with large houses with carved beams and ponderous tiled roofs each standing in its own grounds buried among persimmons and pomegranates with flower gardens under trellised vines and privacy secured by high closely clipped screens of pomegranate and cryptomeria besides the villages of yoshida semoshima kurakawa takayama and tataktaki through or near which we passed i counted over fifty on the plain with their brown sweeping barn roofs looking out from the woodland i cannot see any differences in the style of cultivation yoshida is rich and prosperous looking numa poor and wretched looking 
but the scanty acres of numa rescued from the mountainsides are as exquisitely trim and neat as perfectly cultivated and yield as abundantly of the crops which suit the climate as the broad acres of the sunny plain of yonesawa and this is the case everywhere the field of the sluggard has no existence in japan we rode for four hours through these beautiful villages on a road four feet wide and then to my surprise after ferrying a river emerged at tsukono upon what appears on the map as a secondary road but which is in reality a main road twenty-five feet wide well kept trenched on both sides and with a line of telegraph poles along it it was a new world at once the road for many miles was thronged with well-dressed foot passengers kurumas pack horses and wagons either with solid wheels or wheels with spokes but no tires it is a capital carriage road but without carriages in such civilized circumstances it was curious to see two or four brown-skinned men pulling the carts and quite often a man and his wife the man unclothed and the woman unclothed to her waist doing the same also it struck me as incongruous to see telegraph wires above and below men whose only clothing consisted of a sun hat and fan while children with books and slates were returning from school conning their lessons at akayu a town of hot sulphur springs i hoped to sleep but it was one of the noisiest places i have seen in the most crowded part where four streets meet there are bathing sheds which were full of people of both sexes splashing loudly and the yadoya close to it had about forty rooms in nearly all of which several rheumatic people were lying on the mats samisens were twanging and kotos screeching and the hubbub was so unbearable that i came on here ten miles farther by a fine new road up an uninteresting strath of rice fields and low hills which opens out upon a small plain surrounded by elevated gravelly hills on the slope of one of which kaminoyama a watering-place of over three thousand people is pleasantly situated it is keeping festival there are lanterns and flags on every house and crowds are thronging the temple grounds of which there are several on the hills above it is a clean dry place with beautiful yadoyas on the heights and pleasant houses with gardens and plenty of walks over the hills the people say that it is one of the driest places in japan if it were within reach of foreigners they would find it a wholesome health resort with picturesque excursions in many directions this is one of the great routes of japanese travel and it is interesting to see watering places with their habits amusements and civilization quite complete but borrowing nothing from europe the hot springs here contain iron and are strongly impregnated with sulphuretted hydrogen i tried the temperature of three and found them one hundred degrees one hundred five degrees and one hundred seven degrees they are supposed to be very valuable in rheumatism and they attract visitors from great distances the police who are my frequent informants tell me that there are nearly six hundred people now staying here for the benefit of the baths of which six daily are usually taken i think that in rheumatism as in some other maladies the old-fashioned japanese doctors pay little attention to diet and habits and much to drugs and external applications the benefit of these and other medicinal waters would be much increased if vigorous friction replaced the dabbing with soft towels this is a large yadoya very full of strangers and the housemistress a buxom and most preprocessing widow has a truly exquisite hotel for bathers higher up the hill she has eleven children two or three of whom are tall handsome and graceful girls one blushed deeply at my evident admiration but was not displeased and took me up the hill to see the temples baths and yadoyas of this very attractive place 
I am much delighted with her grace and savoir-faire. I asked the widow how long she had kept the inn, and she proudly answered, three hundred years, not an uncommon instance of the heredity of occupations. My accommodation is unique, a kura or go-down, in a large conventional garden in which is a bath-house, which receives a hot spring at a temperature of 105 degrees, in which I luxuriate. Last night the mosquitoes were awful. If the widow and her handsome girls had not fanned me perseveringly for an hour, I should not have been able to write a line. My new mosquito net succeeds admirably, and, when I am once within it, I rather enjoy the disappointment of the hundreds of drumming, bloodthirsty wretches outside. The widow tells me that housemasters pay two yen once for all for the sign, and an annual tax of two yen on a first-class yadoya, one yen for a second, and fifty cents for a third, with five yen for the license to sell sake. These go-downs, from the Malay word gadong, or fireproof storehouses, are one of the most marked features of Japanese towns, both because they are white, where all else is grey, and because they are solid, where all else is perishable. I am lodged in the lower part, but the iron doors are open, and in their place at night is a paper screen. A few things are kept in my room. Two handsome shrines, from which the unemotional faces of two Buddhas looked out all night, a fine figure of the goddess Kwanon, and a venerable one of the god of longevity, suggested curious dreams. I. L. B. End of section 22twenty three of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May two thousand and twelve. Letter nineteen Kanayama, July sixteen. Three days of travelling on the same excellent road have brought me nearly sixty miles. Kamagataken impresses me as being singularly prosperous, progressive, and go-ahead. The plain of Yamagata, which I entered soon after leaving Kaminoyama, is populous and highly cultivated, and the broad road, with its enormous traffic, looks wealthy and civilized. It is being improved by convicts in dull red kimonos printed with Chinese characters, who correspond with our ticket of leave men, as they are working for wages in the employment of contractors and farmers, and are under no other restriction than that of always wearing the prison dress. At the Sakamoki River I was delighted to come upon the only thoroughly solid piece of modern Japanese work that I have met with, a remarkably handsome stone bridge nearly finished, the first I have seen. I introduced myself to the engineer, Okuno Chiuso, a very gentlemanly, agreeable Japanese, who showed me the plans, took a great deal of trouble to explain them, and courteously gave me tea and sweetmeats. Yamagata, a thriving town of 21,000 people and the capital of the Ken, is well situated on a slight eminence, and this and the dominant position of the Kencho at the top of the main street give it an emphasis unusual in Japanese towns. The outskirts of all the cities are very mean, and the appearance of the lofty white buildings of the new government offices above the low grey houses was much of a surprise. The streets of Yamagata are broad and clean, and it has good shops, among which are long rows selling nothing but ornamental iron kettles and ornamental brasswork. So far in the interior I was annoyed to find several shops almost exclusively for the sale of villainous forgeries of European eatables and drinkables, especially the latter. The Japanese, from the Mikado downwards, have acquired a love of foreign intoxicants, which would be hurtful enough to them if the intoxicants were genuine, but is far worse when they are compounds of vitriol, fusel oil, bad vinegar, and I know not what. 
i saw two shops in yamagata which sold champagne of the best brands martel's cognac bass ale medoc saint julien and scotch whisky at about one-fifth of their cost price all poisonous compounds the sale of which ought to be interdicted the government buildings though in the usual confectionery style are improved by the addition of verandas and the kencho saibancho or courthouse the normal school with advanced schools attached and the police buildings are all in keeping with the good road and obvious prosperity a large two-storied hospital with a cupola which will accommodate one hundred fifty patients and is to be a medical school is nearly finished it is very well arranged and ventilated i cannot say as much for the present hospital which i went over at the courthouse i saw twenty officials doing nothing and as many policemen all in european dress to which they had added an imitation of european manners the total result being unmitigated vulgarity they demanded my passport before they would tell me the population of the ken and city once or twice i have found fault with ito's manners and he has asked me twice since if i think them like the manners of the policemen at yamagata north of yamagata the plain widens and fine longitudinal ranges capped with snow mountains on the one side and broken ranges with lateral spurs on the other enclose as cheerful and pleasant a region as one would wish to see with many pleasant villages on the lower slopes of the hills the mercury was only seventy degrees and the wind north so it was an especially pleasant journey though i had to go three and a half ri beyond tendo a town of five thousand people where i had intended to halt because the only inns at tendo which were not kashitsukeya were so occupied with silkworms that they could not receive me the next day's journey was still along the same fine road through a succession of farming villages and towns of one thousand five hundred and two thousand people such as tochiida and obanasawa were frequent from both these there was a glorious view of chokaisan a grand snow-covered dome said to be eight thousand feet high which rises in an altogether unexpected manner from comparatively level country and as the great snow-fields of udonosan are in sight at the same time with most picturesque curtain ranges below it may be considered one of the grandest views of japan after leaving obanasawa the road passes along a valley watered by one of the affluents of the mogami and after crossing it by a fine wooden bridge ascends a pass from which the view is most magnificent after a long ascent through a region of light peaty soil wooded with pine cryptomeria and scrub oak a long descent and a fine avenue terminate in shinjo a wretched town of over five thousand people situated in a plain of rice fields the day's journey of over twenty-three miles was through villages of farms without yadoyas and in many cases without even tea-houses the style of building has quite changed wood has disappeared and all the houses are now built with heavy beams and walls of laths and brown mud mixed with chopped straw and very neat nearly all are great oblong barns turned endwise to the road fifty sixty and even hundred feet long with the end nearest the road the dwelling-house these farmhouses have no paper windows only amado with a few panes of paper at the top these are drawn back in the daytime and in the better class of houses blinds formed of reeds or split bamboo are let down over the opening there are no ceilings and in many cases an unmolested rat snake lives in the rafters who when he is much gorged occasionally falls down upon a mosquito net again i write that shinjo is a wretched place 
it is a daimyo's town and every daimyo's town that i have seen has an air of decay partly owing to the fact that the castle is either pulled down or has been allowed to fall into decay shinjo has a large trade in rice silk and hemp and ought not to be as poor as it looks the mosquitoes were in thousands and i had to go to bed so as to be out of their reach before i had finished my wretched meal of sago and condensed milk there was a hot rain all night my wretched room was dirty and stifling and rats gnawed my boots and ran away with my cucumbers Today the temperature is high and the sky murky. The good road has come to an end, and the old hardships have begun again. After leaving Shinjo this morning, we crossed over a steep ridge into a singular basin of great beauty, with a semicircle of pyramidal hills, rendered more striking by being covered to their summits with pyramidal cryptomeria, and apparently blocking all northward progress. At their feet lies Kanayama in a romantic situation, and, though I arrived as early as noon, I am staying for a day or two, for my room at the transport office is cheerful and pleasant, the agent is most polite, a very rough region lies before me, and Ito has secured a chicken for the first time since leaving Nikko. I find it impossible in this damp climate and in my present poor health to travel with any comfort for more than two or three days at a time, and it is difficult to find pretty, quiet and wholesome places for a halt of two nights. Freedom from fleas and mosquitoes one can never hope for, though the last vary in number, and I have found a way of dodging the first by laying down a piece of oiled paper six feet square upon the mat dusting along its edges a band of Parisian insect powder, and setting my chair in the middle. I am then insulated, and, though myriads of fleas jump on the paper, the powder stupefies them, and they are easily killed. I have been obliged to rest here at any rate, because I have been stung on my left hand both by a hornet and a gadfly, and it is badly inflamed. In some places the hornets are in hundreds, and make the horses wild. I am also suffering from inflammation produced by the bites of horse ants, which attack one in walking. The Japanese suffer very much from these, and a neglected bite often produces an intractable ulcer. Besides these, there is a fly, as harmless in appearance as our house fly, which bites as badly as a mosquito. These are some of the drawbacks of Japanese travelling in summer, but worse than these is the lack of such food as one can eat when one finishes a hard day's journey without appetite in an exhausting atmosphere. July 18. I have had so much pain and fever from stings and bites that last night I was glad to consult a Japanese doctor from Shinjo. Ito, who looks twice as big as usual when he has to do any grand interpreting, and always puts on silk hakama in honour of it, came in with a middle-aged man dressed entirely in silk, who prostrated himself three times on the ground, and then sat down on his heels. Ito in many words explained my calamities, and Dr. Nozoki then asked to see my honourable hand, which he examined carefully, and then my honourable foot. He felt my pulse and looked at my eyes with a magnifying glass, and with much sucking in of his breath, a sign of good breeding and politeness, informed me that I had much fever, which I knew before, then that I must rest, which I also knew, then he lighted his pipe and contemplated me. Then he felt my pulse and looked at my eyes again, then felt the swelling from the hornet bite, and said it was much inflamed, of which I was painfully aware, and then clapped his hands three times. At this signal a coolie appeared, carrying a handsome black lacquer chest with the same crest in gold upon it as Dr. Nozuki wore in white on his haori. This contained a medicine chest of fine gold lacquer, fitted up with shelves, drawers, bottles, etc. 
he compounded a lotion first with which he bandaged my hand and arm rather skilfully telling me to pour the lotion over the bandage at intervals till the pain abated the whole was covered with oiled paper which answers the purpose of oiled silk he then compounded a febrifuge which as it is purely vegetable i have not hesitated to take and told me to drink it in hot water and to avoid sake for a day or two i asked him what his fee was and after many bows and much sputtering and sucking in of his breath he asked if i should think half a yen too much and when i presented him with a yen and told him with a good deal of profound bowing on my part that i was exceedingly glad to obtain his services his gratitude quite abashed me by its immensity dr nozoki is one of the old-fashioned practitioners whose medical knowledge has been handed down from father to son and who holds out as probably most of his patients do against european methods and drugs a strong prejudice against surgical operations especially amputations exists throughout japan with regard to the latter people think that as they came into the world complete so they are bound to go out of it and in many places a surgeon would hardly be able to buy at any price the privilege of cutting off an arm except from books these older men know nothing of the mechanism of the human body as dissection is unknown to native science dr nozoki told me that he relies mainly on the application of the moxa and on acupuncture in the treatment of acute diseases and in chronic maladies on friction medicinal baths certain animal and vegetable medicines and certain kinds of food the use of leeches and blisters is unknown to him and he regards mineral drugs with obvious suspicion he has heard of chloroform but has never seen it used and considers that in maternity it must necessarily be fatal either to mother or child he asked me and i have twice before been asked the same question whether it is not by its use that we endeavour to keep down our redundant population he has great faith in ginseng and in rhinoceros horn and in the powdered liver of some animal which from the description i understood to be a tiger all specifics of the chinese school of medicines dr nozoki showed me a small box of unicorn's horn which he said was worth more than its weight in gold as my arm improved coincidently with the application of his lotion i am bound to give him the credit of the cure I invited him to dinner, and two tables were produced, covered with different dishes, of which he ate heartily, showing most singular dexterity with his chopsticks in removing the flesh of small bony fish. It is proper to show appreciation of a repast by noisy gulpings, and much gurgling and drawing in of the breath. Etiquette rigidly prescribes these performances, which are much distressing to a European, and my guest nearly upset my gravity by them the host and the kocho or chief man of the village paid me a formal visit in the evening and ito en grande tenue exerted himself immensely on the occasion they were much surprised at my not smoking and supposed me to be under a vow they asked me many questions about our customs and government but frequently reverted to tobacco I will be end of section twenty three. Twenty four of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May two thousand and twelve. Letter twenty, part one. Shingoji july twenty first very early in the morning after my long talk with the kocho of kanayama ito wakened me by saying you'll be able for a long day's journey to-day as you had a chicken yesterday 
and under this chicken's marvellous influence we got away at six forty five only to verify the proverb the more haste the worse speed unsolicited by me the kocho sent round the village to forbid the people from assembling so i got away in peace with a pack-horse and one runner it was a terrible road with two severe mountain passes to cross and i not only had to walk nearly the whole way but to help the man with the kuruma up some of the steepest places halting at the exquisitely situated village of nozoki we got one horse and walked by a mountain road along the headwaters of the omono to inai i wish i could convey to you any idea of the beauty and wildness of that mountain route of the surprises on the way of views on the violent deluges of rain which turned rivulets into torrents and of the hardships and difficulties of the day the scanty fare of sun-dried rice though and sour yellow rasps and the depth of the mire through which we waded we crossed the shione and sakatsu passes and in twelve hours accomplished fifteen miles everywhere we were told that we should never get through the country by the way we are going the women still wear trousers but with a long garment tucked into them instead of a short one and the men wear a cotton combination of breastplate and apron either without anything else or over their kimonos the descent to inai under an avenue of cryptomeria and the village itself shut in with the rushing omono are very beautiful the yadoya at inai was a remarkably cheerful one but my room was entirely fusuma and shoji and people were peeping in the whole time it is not only a foreigner and his strange ways which attract attention in these remote districts but in my case my india rubber bath air pillow and above all my white mosquito net their nets are all of a heavy green canvas and they admire mine so much that i can give no more acceptable present on leaving than a piece of it to twist in with the hair there were six engineers in the next room who are surveying the passes which i had crossed in order to see if they could be tunnelled in which case kurumas might go all the way from tokyo to kubota on the sea of japan and with a small additional outlay carts also in the two villages of upper and lower inai there has been an outbreak of a malady much dreaded by the japanese called kake which in the last seven months has carried off one hundred persons out of a population of about fifteen hundred and the local doctors have been aided by two sent from the medical school at kubota i don't know a european name for it the japanese name signifies an affection of the legs its first symptoms are a loss of strength in the legs looseness in the knees cramps in the calves swelling and numbness this dr anderson who has studied kake in more than one thousand one hundred cases in tokyo calls the subacute form the chronic is a slow numbing and wasting malady which if unchecked results in death from paralysis and exhaustion in from six months to three years the third or acute form dr anderson describes thus after remarking that the grave symptoms set in quite unexpectedly and go on rapidly increasing he says the patient now can lie down no longer he sits up in bed and tosses restlessly from one position to another and with wrinkled brow staring and anxious eyes dusky skin blue parted lips dilated nostrils throbbing neck and labouring chest presents a picture of the most terrible distress that the worst of diseases can inflict there is no intermission even for a moment and the physician here almost powerless can do little more than note the failing pulse and falling temperature and wait for the moment when the brain paralyzed by the carbonized blood shall become insensible and allow the dying man to pass his last moments in merciful unconsciousness the next morning after riding nine miles through a quagmire and the grand avenues of cryptomeria and noticing with regret that the telegraph poles ceased we reached yuzova a town of seven thousand people in which had it not been for provoking delays 
I should have slept instead of at Inai, and found that a fire a few hours previously had destroyed seventy houses, including the Yadoya at which I should have lodged. We had to wait two hours for horses, as all were engaged in moving property and people. The ground where the houses had stood was absolutely bare of everything but fine black ash, among which the kuras stood blackened, and, in some instances, slightly cracked, but in all unharmed. Already skeletons of new houses were rising. No life had been lost except that of a tipsy man, but I should probably have lost everything but my money. End of section 24twenty five of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May two thousand and twelve. Letter twenty, part two. Yuzova is a specially objectionable looking place. I took my lunch, a wretched meal of a tasteless white curd made from beans, with some condensed milk added to it in a yard and the people crowded in hundreds to the gate and those behind being unable to see me got ladders and climbed on the adjacent roofs where they remained till one of the roofs gave way with a loud crash and precipitated about fifty men women and children into the room below which fortunately was vacant nobody screamed a noteworthy fact and the casualties were only a few bruises Four policemen then appeared and demanded my passport, as if I were responsible for the accident, and failing, like all others, to read a particular word upon it, they asked me what I was travelling for, and on being told to learn about the country, they asked if I was making a map. Having satisfied their curiosity, they disappeared, and the crowd surged up again in fuller force. The transport agent begged them to go away, but they said they might never see such a sight again. One old peasant said he would go away if he were told whether the sight were a man or a woman, and, on the agent asking if that were any business of his, he said he should like to tell at home what he had seen, which awoke my sympathy at once, and I told Ito to tell them that a Japanese horse galloping night and day without ceasing would take five and a half weeks to reach my country, a statement which he is using lavishly as I go along. These are such queer crowds, so silent and gaping, and they remain motionless for hours, the wide-awake babies on the mother's backs and in their father's arms never crying. I should be glad to hear a hearty aggregate laugh, even if I were its object. The great melancholy stare is depressing. The road for ten miles was thronged with country people going in to see the fire. It was a good road and very pleasant country, with numerous roadside shrines and figures of the Goddess of Mercy. I had a wicked horse, thoroughly vicious. His head was doubly chained to the saddle girth, but he never met man, woman, or child without laying back his ears and running at them to bite them. I was so tired and in so much spinal pain that I got off and walked several times, and it was most difficult to get on again, for as soon as I put my hand on the saddle he swung his hind legs round to kick me, and it required some agility to avoid being hurt. Nor was this all. The evil beast made dashes with his tethered head at flies, threatening to twist or demolish my foot at each, flung his hind legs upwards, attempted to dislodge flies on his nose with his hind hoof, executed capers which involved the total disappearance of everything in front of the saddle, squealed, stumbled, kicked his old shoes off, and resented the feeble attempts which the mago made to replace them, and finally walked into Yokote and down its long and dismal street, mainly on its hind legs, shaking the rope out of his timid leader's hand and shaking me into a sort of aching jelly. I used to think that horses were made vicious either by being teased or by violence in breaking, but this does not account for the malignity of the Japanese horses, 
for the people are so much afraid of them that they treat them with great respect they are not beaten or kicked are spoken to in soothing tones and on the whole live better than their masters perhaps this is the secret of their villainy jeshurun waxed fat and kicked yokote a small town of ten thousand people in which the best yadoyas are all non-respectable is an ill-favoured ill-smelling forlorn dirty damp miserable place with a large trade in cottons as i rode through on my temporary biped the people rushed out from the baths to see me men and women alike without a particle of clothing the housemaster was very polite but i had a dark and dirty room up a bamboo ladder and it swarmed with fleas and mosquitoes to an exasperating extent on the way i heard that a bullock was killed every thursday in yokote and had decided on having a broiled steak for supper and taking another with me but when i arrived it all was sold there were no eggs and i made a miserable meal of rice and bean curd feeling somewhat starved as the condensed milk i bought at yamagata had to be thrown away i was somewhat wretched from fatigue and inflamed ant bites but in the early morning hot and misty as all the mornings have been i went to see a shinto temple or miya and though i went alone escaped a throng the entrance into the temple court was as usual by a torii which consisted of two large posts twenty feet high surmounted with cross beams the upper one of which projects beyond the posts and frequently curves upwards at both ends the whole as is often the case was painted a dull red this torii or bird's rest is said to be so called because the fowls which were formerly offered but not sacrificed were accustomed to perch upon it a straw rope with straw tassels and strips of paper hanging from it the special emblem of shinto hung across the gateway in the paved court there were several handsome granite lanterns on fine granite pedestals such as are the nearly universal accompaniments of both shinto and buddhist temples after leaving yakote we passed through very pretty country with mountain views and occasional glimpses of the snowy dome of chokaizan crossed the omono which has burst its banks and destroyed its bridges by two troublesome ferries and arrived at rokugo a town of five thousand people with fine temples exceptionally mean houses and the most aggressive crowd by which i have yet been asphyxiated there through the good offices of the police i was enabled to attend the buddhist funeral of a merchant of some wealth it interested me very much from its solemnity and decorum and ito's explanations of what went before were remarkably distinctly given i went in a japanese woman's dress borrowed at the tea-house with a blue hood over my head and thus escaped all notice but i found the restraint of the scanty tied forward kimono very tiresome ito gave me many injunctions as to what i was to do and avoid which i carried out faithfully being nervously anxious to avoid jarring on the sensibilities of those who had kindly permitted a foreigner to be present the illness was a short one and there had been no time either for prayers or pilgrimages on the sick man's behalf when death occurs the body is laid with its head to the north a position that the living japanese scrupulously avoid near a folding screen between which and it a new zen is placed on which are a saucer of oil with a lighted rush cakes of uncooked rice dough and a saucer of incense sticks the priests directly after death choose the kaimyo or posthumous name write it on a tablet of white wood and seat themselves by the corpse his zen bowls cups etc are filled with vegetable food and are placed by his side the chopsticks being put on the wrong that is the left side of the zen at the end of forty-eight hours the corpse is arranged for the coffin by being washed with warm water and the priest while saying certain prayers shaves the head 
in all cases rich or poor the dress is of the usual make but of pure white linen or cotton at omagori a town near rokugo large earthenware jars are manufactured which are much used for interment by the wealthy but in this case there were two square boxes the outer one being of finely planed wood of the retinospora obtusa the poor use what is called the quick tub a covered tub of pine hooped with bamboo women are dressed for burial in the silk robe worn on the marriage day tabi are placed beside them or on their feet and their hair usually flows loosely behind them the wealthiest people fill the coffin with vermilion and the poorest use chaff but in this case i heard that only the mouth nose and ears were filled with vermilion and that the coffin was filled up with coarse incense the body is placed within the tub or box in the usual squatting position it is impossible to understand how a human body many hours after dead can be pressed into the limited space afforded by even the outermost of the boxes it has been said that the rigidity of a corpse is overcome by the use of a powder called dosia which is sold by the priests but this idea has been exploded and the process remains incomprehensible bannerets of small size and ornamental staves were outside the house door two men in blue dresses with pale blue overgarments resembling wings received each person two more presented a lacquered bowl of water and a white silk crepe towel and then we passed into a large room round which were arranged a number of very handsome folding screens on which lotuses storks and peonies were realistically painted on a dead gold ground near the end of the room the coffin under a canopy of white silk upon which there was a very beautiful arrangement of artificial white lotuses rested upon trestles the face of the corpse being turned towards the north six priests very magnificently dressed sat on each side of the coffin and two more knelt in front of a small temporary altar the widow an extremely pretty woman squatted near the deceased below the father and mother and after her came the children relatives and friends who sat in rows dressed in winged garments of blue and white the widow was painted white her lips were reddened with vermilion her hair was elaborately dressed and ornamented with carved shell pins she wore a beautiful dress of sky-blue silk with a haori of fine white crepe and a scarlet crepe girdle embroidered in gold and looked like a bride on her marriage day rather than a widow indeed owing to the beauty of the dresses and the amount of blue and white silk the room had a festal rather than a funereal look when all the guests had arrived tea and sweetmeats were passed round incense was burned profusely litanies were mumbled and the bustle of moving to the grave began during which i secured a place near the gate of the temple grounds the procession did not contain the father or mother of the deceased but i understood that the mourners who composed it were all relatives the oblong tablet with the dead name of the deceased was carried first by a priest then the lotus blossom by another priest then ten priests followed two and two chanting litanies from books then came the coffin on a platform borne by four men and covered with white drapery then the widow and then the other relatives the coffin was carried into the temple and laid upon trestles while incense was burned and prayers were said and was then carried to a shallow grave lined with cement and prayers were said by the priests until the earth was raised to the proper level when all dispersed and the widow in her gay attire walked home unattended there were no hired mourners or any signs of grief but nothing could be more solemn reverent and decorous than the whole service i have seen many funerals chiefly of the poor and though shorn of much of the ceremony and with only one officiating priest the decorum was always most remarkable 
the fees to the priests are from two up to forty or fifty yen the graveyard which surrounds the temple was extremely beautiful and the cryptomeria especially fine it was very full of stone gravestones and like all japanese cemeteries exquisitely kept as soon as the grave was filled in a life-size pink lotus plant was placed upon it and a lacquer tray on which were lacquer bowls containing tea or sake beans and sweetmeats the temple at rokugo was very beautiful and except that its ornaments were superior in solidity and good taste differed little from a romish church the low altar on which were lilies and lighted candles was draped in blue and silver and on the high altar draped in crimson and cloth of gold there was nothing but a closed shrine an incense burner and a vase of lotuses end of section twenty five six of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in may two thousand and twelve letter twenty part three at a wayside tea-house soon after leaving rokugo in kurumas i met the same courteous and agreeable young doctor who was stationed at inai during the prevalence of kake and he invited me to visit the hospital of kubota of which he is junior physician and told ito of a restaurant at which foreign food can be obtained a pleasant prospect of which he is always reminding me travelling along a very narrow road i as usual first we met a man leading a prisoner by a rope followed by a policeman as soon as my runner saw the letter he fell down on his face so suddenly in the shafts as nearly to throw me out at the same time trying to wriggle into a garment which he had carried on the crossbar while the young men who were drawing the two kurumas behind crouching behind my vehicle tried to scuttle into their clothes i never saw such a picture of abjectness as my men presented he trembled from head to foot and illustrated that queer phrase often heard in scotch presbyterian prayers lay our hands on our mouths and our mouths in the dust he literally grovelled in the dust and with every sentence that a policeman spoke raised his head a little to bow it yet more deeply than before it was all because he had no clothes on I interceded for him as the day was very hot, and the policeman said he would not arrest him, as he should otherwise have done, because of the inconvenience that it would cause to a foreigner. He was quite an elderly man and never recovered his spirits, but as soon as a turn of the road took us out of the policeman's sight, the two younger men threw their clothes into the air and gambolled in the shafts, shrieking with laughter on reaching shingoji being too tired to go farther i was dismayed to find nothing but a low dark foul-smelling room enclosed only by dirty shoji in which to spend sunday one side looked into a little mildewed court with a slimy growth of protococcus viridis and into which the people of another house constantly came to stare the other side opened on the earthen passage into the street where travellers wash their feet the third into the kitchen and the fourth into the front room even before dark it was alive with mosquitoes and the fleas hopped on the mats like sand flies there were no eggs nothing but rice and cucumbers at five on sunday morning i saw three faces pressed against the outer lattice and before evening the shoji were riddled with finger holes at each of which a dark eye appeared there was a still fine rain all day with the mercury at eighty two degrees and the heat darkness and smells were difficult to endure in the afternoon a small procession passed the house consisting of a decorated palanquin carried and followed by priests with capes and stoles over crimson chasubles and white cassocks this ark they said contained papers inscribed with the names of people and the evils they feared 
and the priests were carrying the papers to throw them into the river. I went to bed early as a refuge from mosquitoes, with the andon, as usually, dimly lighting the room, and shut my eyes. About nine I heard a good deal of whispering and shuffling, which continued for some time, and, on looking up, saw opposite to me about forty men, women, and children, Ito says one hundred, all staring at me, with the light upon their faces. They had silently removed three of the shoji next the passage. I called Ito loudly and clapped my hands, but they did not stir till he came, and then they fled like a flock of sheep. I have patiently, and even smilingly, borne all out-of-doors crowding and curiosity, but this kind of intrusion is unbearable, and I sent Ito to the police station, much against his will, to beg the police to keep the people out of the house, as the housemaster was unable to do so. This morning, as I was finishing dressing, a policeman appeared in my room, ostensibly to apologize for the behavior of the people, but in reality to have a privileged stare at me, and, above all, at my stretcher and mosquito net, from which he hardly took his eyes. Ito says he could make a yen a day by showing them. The policeman said that the people had never seen a foreigner. I. L. B. End of section 26「of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan」by Isabella L. Bird。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2012. Letter 21. Kubota, July 23rd. I arrived here on Monday afternoon by the river Omono, what would have been two long days' journey by land having been easily accomplished in nine hours by water. This was an instance of forming a plan wisely and adhering to it resolutely. Firmness in travelling is nowhere more necessary than in Japan. I decided some time ago, from Mr. Brunton's map, that the Omono must be navigable from Shingoji, and a week ago told Ito to inquire about it. But at each place difficulties have been started. There was too much water, there was too little, there were bad rapids, there were shallows, it was too late in the year, all the boats which had started lately were lying aground, but at one of the ferries I saw in the distance a merchandise boat going down, and told Ito I should go that way and no other. On arriving at Shingoji, they said it was not on the Omono at all, but on a stream with some very bad rapids in which boats are broken to pieces. Lastly, they said there was no boat, but on my saying that I would send ten miles for one, a small, flat-bottomed scow was produced by the transport agent, into which Ito, the luggage, and myself accurately fitted. Ito sententiously observed, Not one thing has been told us on our journey which has turned out true. This is not an exaggeration. The usual crowd did not assemble round the door, but preceded me to the river, where it covered the banks and clustered in the trees. Four policemen escorted me down. The voyage of forty-two miles was delightful. The rapids were a mere ripple, the current was strong, one boatman almost slept upon his paddle, the other only woke to bail the boat when it was half full of water. The shores were silent and pretty, and almost without population till we reached the large town of Araya, which straggles along a high bank for a considerable distance and after nine peaceful hours we turned off from the main stream of the Omono, just at the outskirts of Kubota, and pulled up a narrow, green river, fringed by dilapidated backs of houses, boat-building yards, and rafts of timber on one side, and dwelling-houses, gardens, and damp greenery on the other. This stream is crossed by very numerous bridges. I got a cheerful upstairs room at a most friendly yadoya, and my three days here have been fully occupied and very pleasant. Foreign food, 
a good beefsteak an excellent curry cucumbers and foreign salt and mustard were at once obtained and i felt my eyes lightened after partaking of them kubota is a very attractive and purely japanese town of thirty six thousand people the capital of akita ken a fine mountain called taihesan rises above its fertile valley and the omono falls into the sea of japan close to it it has a number of kurumas but owing to heavy sand and the badness of the roads they can only go three miles in any direction it is a town of activity and brisk trade and manufactures a silk fabric in stripes of blue and black and yellow and black much used for making hakama and kimonos a species of white silk crap with a raised woof which brings a high price in tokyo shops fusuma and clogs though it is a castle town it is free from the usual deadly lively look and has an air of prosperity and comfort though it has few streets of shops it covers a great extent of ground with streets and lanes of pretty isolated dwelling-houses surrounded by trees gardens and well-trimmed hedges each garden entered by a substantial gateway the existence of something like a middle class with home privacy and home life is suggested by these miles of comfortable suburban residences foreign influence is hardly at all felt there is not a single foreigner in government or any other employment and even the hospital was organized from the beginning by japanese doctors this fact made me greatly desire to see it but on going there at the proper hour for visitors i was met by the director with courteous but vexatious denial no foreigner could see it he said without sending his passport to the governor and getting a written order so i complied with these preliminaries and eight a m of the next day was fixed for my visit ito who is lazy about interpreting for the lower orders but exerts himself to the utmost on such an occasion as this went with me handsomely clothed in silk as befitted an interpreter and surpassed all his former efforts the director and the staff of six physicians all handsomely dressed in silk met me at the top of the stairs and conducted me to the management room where six clerks were writing here there was a table solemnly covered with a white cloth and four chairs on which the director the chief physician ito and i sat and pipes tea and sweetmeats were produced after this accompanied by fifty medical students whose intelligent looks promise well for their success we went round the hospital which is a large two-storied building in semi-european style but with deep verandas all round the upper floor is used for classrooms and the lower accommodates one hundred patients besides a number of resident students ten is the largest number treated in any one room and severe cases are treated in separate rooms gangrene has prevailed and the chief physician who is at this time remodelling the hospital has closed some of the wards in consequence there is a lock hospital under the same roof about fifty important operations are annually performed under chloroform but the people of akita ken are very conservative and object to part with their limbs and to foreign drugs this conservatism diminishes the number of patients the odour of carbolic acid pervaded the whole hospital and there were spray producers enough to satisfy mr lister at the request of dr k i saw the dressing of some very severe wounds carefully performed with carbolized gauze and the spray of carbolic acid the fingers of the surgeon and the instrument used being all carefully bathed in the disinfectant dr k said it was difficult to teach the students the extreme carefulness with regard to minor details which is required in the antiseptic treatment which he regards as one of the greatest discoveries of this century i was very much impressed with the fortitude shown by the surgical patients who went through very severe pain without a wince or a moan eye cases are unfortunately very numerous 
Dr. K. attributes their extreme prevalence to overcrowding, defective ventilation, poor living, and bad light. After our round, we returned to the management room to find a meal laid out in English style, coffee in cups with handles and saucers, and plates with spoons. After this, pipes were again produced, and the director and medical staff escorted me to the entrance, where we all bowed profoundly. I was delighted to see that Dr. Kayabashi, a man under thirty and fresh from Tokyo, and all the staff and students were in the national dress with the hakama of rich silk. It is a beautiful dress and assists dignity as much as the ill-fitting European costume detracts from it. This was a very interesting visit, in spite of the difficulty of communication through an interpreter. The public buildings with their fine gardens and the broad road near which they stand, with its stone-faced embankments, are very striking in such a far-off ken. Among the finest of the buildings is the normal school, where I shortly afterwards presented myself, but I was not admitted till I had shown my passport and explained my objects in travelling. These preliminaries being settled, Mr. Tomatsu Aoki, the chief director, and Mr. Shude Kane Nigishi, the principal teacher, both looking more like monkeys than men in their European clothes, lionized me. The first was most trying, for he persisted in attempting to speak English, of which he knows about as much as I know of Japanese, but the last, after some grotesque attempts, accepted Ito's services. The school is a commodious Europeanized building, three stories high, and from its upper balcony the view of the city, with its grey roofs and abundant greenery, and surrounding mountains and valleys, is very fine. The equipments of the different classrooms surprised me, especially the laboratory of the chemical classroom and the truly magnificent illustrative apparatus in the natural science classroom. Gano's Physics is the textbook of that department. I.L.B. End of section 27